the first 20 episodes of mine, if you go back to them, I am awful on them. You know, I'm stuttering. My questions aren't that good. Like all this stuff. The first one I ever recorded, I got a warm intro to Melody Perkins, the co-founder of Canva. So my first ever interview was with her. Okay, this tells you how amazing she is. About 18 minutes in, I was like, yeah, I don't have any more questions, but we need this to be at least 45 minutes. What do you want to talk about? And then her and her marketer were like, oh, we could talk. And then we're just like brainstorming. Then we record for five minutes. Hey, do you got anyone else have another question? We got, we went back and forth. You'll listen to the episode now and it sounds really good, but that's how bad my first episode was. So I don't think any of your listeners could have it any worse than that. (laughs) But so yeah, just start and go. (laughs) On this episode of Establishing Your Empire, I host Sean Flynn. Sean started his career as a business owner, where he founded and grew a successful company in Beijing, China. He then returned to the U.S. to work with companies ranging from fast-growing Silicon Valley startups to established overseas public companies. He brings his international experience working with all stages and sectors of businesses to his role as principal at an investment bank with expertise in mergers and acquisitions, capital markets, financial restructuring, and valuation. Sean is also the host of the award-winning show, The Silicon Valley Podcast. And in this episode, we discuss everything from living abroad and language learning to how and when to raise capital so you can scale your startup. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography. But business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, I got Sean Flynn here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Sean, thank you so much for stopping by virtually and doing this podcast with me. Oh, Darren, thank you for having me on your show. This is an honor and I'm excited for our conversation today. Why don't we start with like, you know, who is Sean Flynn? What, what's kind of like the elevator pitch that you give people when you talk about yourself? I mean, the short elevator pitch. After college, I wanted to travel. I lived abroad for almost eight years. Most of that was in Beijing, China. Started a couple companies, one did okay. Partner bought me out, came back to the US. Since coming back to the US in 2013, I've been heavily involved in the startup ecosystem from working with an angel group to a global incubator focused on AI and blockchain to now an investment bank with six offices, 15 bankers, and uh, focused mergers, acquisitions, growth capital, and secondaries. But you know, I'm based in Silicon Valley, so it's it's mostly around tech. So my life has been Kind of crazy, but it's been a lot of fun. Let's start right off the bat with, you know, you were in Beijing, China for like over four years. How, let's start with like, how did that actually first happen? Like, how did you say, okay, I'm going to go to China? Well, it, it, I didn't. So going back when I was in undergrad, I did mechanical engineer and I really wanted to travel. I wanted to do that semester abroad. You mm-hmm. know, you got to see the people that had the, the psychology majors, the sociology majors, you know, all your friends, they're traveling, they're coming back from Spain, from Portugal, from all these places and telling you about how magical it was. And you're sitting there in the computer lab in the engineer room, you know, hating life, not seeing any, not seeing sunlight or anything. And so when I graduated college, I wanted to go abroad and I actually had the opportunity to go to Costa Rica. I had a friend there in the Peace Corps. She had a girlfriend. Of course, there in Costa Rica, same-sex relationships are, are not as open, at least back then. They said, hey, you want to come down here, be the pretend boyfriend so people would leave us alone? I was unemployed. I went, okay, just graduate college. I have nothing to do. I'll go down there for a few months. That few months ended up to be almost two years. And wow. I learned so much in that time. Every month I was there, I figured I learned more a month here than a year in college learning a culture, a language, a new way of life, going from what I saw in the U.S. to this town in Costa Rica where it was, you know, the Peace Corps was there. You could rent, to put it in perspective, people have asked me, like, how'd you survive there? And I went, well, okay, I had my own room, food, laundry, all organic food, everything, you know, HB, all this stuff. 
my rent, everything included, was sixty U.S. dollars a month. You could get a three bedroom house there for ninety U.S. dollars, and there was vacant houses because no one could afford it. And you're like, that that kind of put things in perspective. Wow, you know this area. So I was there, and what was really interesting is in Costa Rica at that time. This was back. 2005, 2007, they had a lot of call centers there, same time zone as the U.S. A lot of Costa Ricans work in the U.S., whether legally or illegally at any given time. A lot of U.S. citizens go down there for retirement, huge expat community. So English is very well spoken there. And so they had the call centers and they started opening up little little sectors of the call center, little call centers for Chinese. And the thought was, and I, I got to talk to one of the call center's owners, they said, listen, if we speak Spanish, English, and Mandarin in our call centers, we have half the world's population right here. And I went, oh my gosh, this is interesting. So I'd been to, in Costa Rica for a little over a year at that time, about a year and a half, and I started doing some research on China, realized in 2008, the Beijing Olympics were going to be held, or the Olympics were held in Beijing. And I went, how cool would it be? to go to Beijing, start studying Chinese, do everything I was doing in Costa Rica, but over there. And remember, at the same time, I'm talking to my buddies. We all graduated 2005 engineering degrees. They're telling me, oh, life is horrible here. I'm working 60, 70 hours. Sean, how are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, I went hiking and I saw a Cassell and there were howler monkeys. And, you know, I right. want my my journey to continue because I kept hearing all this feedback from them and their lives. And I went, Jesus, how great would it be? Go to China. China seems to be on this super growth path. Learn the language, learn the culture, do everything I did in Costa Rica, do that in China. I bet I could do it in a year, maybe two, now that I've had this experience in Costa Rica and just really open all these doors in the future. But China is a different beast. It's not like learning Spanish. The culture is a different world. It was, I mean, it took me five years almost to to kind of feel the same level of comfort as I felt in Costa Rica after, you know, being there only four or five months. So I've been to Shanghai. I've never been to Beijing. My wife has. She she used to work for a, a company based in Singapore, so she was in over there a, a lot. But I mean, it's a, it is a different world. Like when you go to China, that, that kind of vacation is, it's not easy. Like just getting around can be difficult. Like I remember... Last time when I went to Shanghai, it was probably 2015, 2016, somewhere in that vicinity. But, you know, there's no Google. So like you're you no know, Google Maps. I remember this one day I was going to do this whole thing and I'm a photographer. So I got my photography stuff. I'm going to do this whole thing, go to a Hangzhou, which is this little, uh, you know, island town. I got all my stuff written out and I go to the train station and then all the towns were symbols. And I go, oh, wait, <laughs> I'm supposed to buy this ticket. I can't figure out where to go. So, yeah. It's a different world, a lot of fun there, but a different world for sure. And, and how did, I want to do a quick segue about learning languages. So, okay, you're obviously English speaking and then Spanish. Like, how was that process for Mandarin? Was there any tips or tricks just how to learn a language quicker or like how you actually did learn a language in any, any way you want to take it? Yeah, fully emerge yourself. And what I mean by that is when I was in Mandarin, okay, for Costa Rica, I was lucky. In the area I was, there wasn't many people that could speak English. I actually volunteered at an elderly care facility where the old people just wanted to tell me all day long about their grandkids. And I just sat there and listened and played chess or checkers, just trying to absorb the language and then say it to people, you know, in the evening at, you know, soccer field or, or little playa, the park area. China, I didn't have that. China, everyone was coming up to me, trying to speak to me in English, trying to practice what they've learned years and years at school, you know, read and write, but they've never had the opportunity to speak to anyone. So as bad as it sounds, I, uh, I kind of told everyone that, sorry, I'm from Costa Rica. I only speak Spanish. I'm not American. And, uh, you know, it's good or bad, right? So the bad thing was everyone rushed to the Americans to talk to them. <laughs> the, the good thing, well, I guess, I don't know. But the other side of it, the people that talked to me only talked to me in Chinese. So I went to the, the the Chinese gym where the trainers would smoke in the gym and spit in the designated plant spit box. I I, went, I lived with my roommate was Chinese. He had no idea I was American until he actually found my passport one day. My girlfriend 
at the time didn't speak any English. And now, you know, she's my my wife. We've been married wow. for several years now. But I fully immersed myself in the language, in the culture, everything. I even went to the school where I was. The, there was two Americans at the school when I was there. I mean, they knew I was American, but everyone else was from Russia or someplace and their English was broken. So we had to eat, try to speak to each other in Chinese. And yeah, that's for me, that's the only way to do it, to be honest, is to do that 100 percent immersion where you're sitting there. You know, I can't even order because there's nothing in English. I'm just pointing to stuff, you know, in tears because you're losing weight because you can't order anything you actually want to eat. And you're like, I got to make this. I got to make this work and yeah. just grunting it out for nine months. Yeah. And I think it's not just immersion, it sounds like, but also don't make it easy on yourself by just, you know, trying to get them to understand your language, but understand theirs. But it, it, real quick though, uh, a gambe. So a little, little mm -hmm. drink there. You go to Beijing, like, and you got this degree, like, w did you have any job opportunities that you've, before you went, or did you just go? Like, how'd that happen? So after Costa Rica, I went back to the U.S., worked for about seven months at Macy's selling women's shoes, which was the greatest job ever. It taught me sales. It taught me how to mirror and match people, how to use the vocabulary of the person buy-in. Oh, those are so fun. Oh, you know, this and that. It taught me a lot of sales skills. But so use that I, I, I've, I've sold shoes as well. So before, back <laughs> in college. So uh, there must be something to it. Hey, uh, who knows? I bet they do a survey. They'll be like, wait, all, all successful people sold women's shoes at one time in their life. Oh. <laughs> so, so I had a little money saved, went to, went to China. There's always that opportunity to teach English. There's always that opportunity to be an extra in a movie or, you know, do voiceover work or something like that. I didn't want to go that route. I did see other people doing it. And yes, I did teach English on occasion. I would substitute in that, helped out a friend just to, if I needed pocket money and that. But I actually really wanted to start my own companies. I really wanted to do my own thing and just kind of see if I could survive and make it in, with the thought of, you know, if I could do this in a language I'm not familiar with and grow something here, all challenges in the future are going to be easy. How did you actually start your own company? How did you meet somebody? How, how did that actually happen? Because I think a lot of people, even just here in the U.S., want to start something, but they always get stuck. So how did that happen? So the first couple of companies, so I, I, I tried many. I will admit to three, and two of those were just awful failures, which allowed me for the third one to be successful. And the one, and like I said, I tried several and debacles, but the ones I will admit to. The first one was an outsource uh, team. I knew some people here in Silicon Valley. They were outsourced in India. I said, hey, you know, this was back in 2009, 2010 when Yahoo and Google were still in Beijing. I said, hey, I have all these contacts at Yahoo and that that have extra hours. Why not pay me to have them do programming for you? at a huge reduced price and things were going okay until that unfortunate day where my my the manager of the team so I had eight engineers at this time I had the manager I was like yeah this is going great I paid one of them he's all happy I was like why are you so happy it's just, we just finished a job you know it's a normal thing I didn't really think out anything of it and he's like well guess what I was like what he's like well, they're going to have to pay us again. I was like, wh why would they have to pay us again? We already, we, we did the, you know, project, everything. He's like, well, we put bugs in the program. So now they're going to have to pay us to fix everything. And they're all smiling, like the whole team. I was like, oh my gosh, you got like, I'm calling my contact in the US, you know, two weeks go by, they're not picking up anything. And then finally it was, it was, hey, you're lucky we don't sue you. Don't ever contact us again. We're done. I was like, understood, perfect. And, you know, I'm going to the team, like, well, this company shut down and yeah. uh, move on from there. Of course, they said, hey, let's import Jade to the U.S. We have contacts here. I was like, I don't, I don't trust anyone in this group anymore. <laughs> so that, that was the first failure. But, you know, I learned a lot from there. Second one I tried doing. You, do you ever know that? Are you into MMA at all? Yes. Okay. I, I, I used, so I know you, you're a jiu-jitsu guy. So I used to wrestle and my old roommate became a professional fighter for a short period of time. So I, I, you know, especially during college when it was like UFC was blowing up or a little bit after college, but 
Oh man, I used to watch it. I don't watch it much anymore, but I used to watch it all the time. Oh, fantastic. So then you know the brand Tap Out, right? The clothing yeah, of company. Course. Yes. So this was this was back when uh, John Chia Tren, he was the first Chinese fighter to be in the UFC. Huge press leading up to the fight. He trained at the same gym I went to. So I was there. I, I was training at China Top Team with the best Chinese fighters. And it was just so odd, you know, this guy had the middleweight championship for legends. This guy, you know, art of war champion. This guy, all these champions were in this one gym. And we, there's finally that one guy that's going to find the UFC. Me and one of the fighters were like, let's put make a clothing line. Let's copy, tap out. Let's do everything tap out did. Sponsor the fighters. Have them wear the merchandise. You know, they go fight. We get big. And that failed because John Chitren found the UFC and then tap out came and gave everyone contracts. So the company yeah. we wanted yeah. to model came and took us out. So so that failed. And then the final company, the one that did good, I had the Chinese partner that I had trusted. I had built years relationship with the person. I knew their connections. They knew my connections. We we had it. It, it was everything I had learned from those first two businesses that failed and some other little things. I brought in a third one. You know, vetted this person, knew their contacts, knew you know Guanxi as you'd call it with everyone. And, and knew that contracts weren't anything that it was all shake of the hand, you know, and that one actually succeeded. We found a little niche in the market where the at that time, everyone wanted foreigners to teach classes. I'm sure they still do. But at least back then, 2011, 2012, universities couldn't provide foreigners the, the visas to teach. So we would go to companies, have them sponsor the foreigners, provide them with the work visas and this. Teachers would then work at the universities. We would be the middle person, cut, you know, staff and agency fundamentally. And then from there, we grew to getting contracts with Microsoft and all these other companies that needed people to read senses for the the voice commands, voiceover work. The list went on and on for, you know, native speakers, the need in Beijing, China. And we were in three provinces at the end. Wow. So, you know, I hear a couple of things there for especially with your kind of the ones that didn't didn't succeed as uh, as long at least is one you got to work with people that you trust and I, and I completely agree that agree with this and you might need to vet them beforehand slow down a little bit before you you know some, sometimes you get all excited you just want to go 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 the other thing is controlling your own destiny can be powerful whereas when you have you're always going to run into something right that's going to kind of shut you off but at least have more than one leg to stand on, probably, <laughs> because you know, with not that you could have saw that tap out would it would have would have shut you down, but you know that just happens, especially when you're a million miles away. But and and then I I mean, so I'm in e-commerce, so this this translation business and what I always call localization is huge. You know, if I translate something from English to Mandarin, it's not going to work. <laughs> Sentence structure is going to be a mess. You know, so we would always hire people that were local or at least came from China to to be able to sell in those areas because otherwise you just couldn't. So I'm sure that did extremely well. Oh, it was always funny hearing, you know, Microsoft saying we need 100 foreigners for this voice command stuff in Beijing, China, like native English speakers. And you're like, where, where, where are you guys going to get them? You know, <laughs> it, it was just so many ridiculous things, but those are opportunities. And, you know, we were able to, to capitalize on them. So obviously that company did well, but, you know, and you exited. So how, how did that happen? How did you get out of the company and what happened next? Mm, so in China, and this is one thing that I really started noticing and maybe things have changed, but at that time, I noticed a lot of other foreigners when they would grow a company, it would get to a certain size. And then suddenly it was kind of either taken from them or they were pushed out. You could look at that however you'd like, but. I was noticing that with with our company where, you know, <laughs> things were happening where, oh, money has to be allocated over here. Money has to be allocated over there or and, and it, it was getting more and more difficult to actually do business. The more kind of successful we were going, the more these people came involved and in asking for favors and everything else. So for me, I was I was noticing, OK, this is about time for me to step back. My my business partner. I mean, she kept looking at it as this is great. All these people, you know, we're building Guanxi with them. And then 20 years from now, we're going to be up here and they'll owe us favors and all this other stuff. And I was like, no, nah, it's not not for me. I'm going to be pushed out. And 
And then at that time, there was some a family emergency. I came back to the U.S. for a little bit of time. My, my dad had had a heart attack. And I went back to China. I no, noticed some of the numbers were different. Some money was missing, other things. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to exit. Just went to my partner and said, okay, this is kind of what the valuation of the company is based on our last year earnings. This is the percentage I own. Let's sit down, talk out something where, you know, you can pay me enough now that I'm happy and that we we leave on friendly terms. And we had that discussion and, and you know, to this day, we're still friends. And, you know, the last time I was in China, we had dinner, we met, but a lot of it was just, okay, let's look at our agreement, what we put in, the financials, what do you need on the side for working capital to keep running, to keep growing? How can we make this a win-win for everyone? Because I, I was kind of leaving on a short notice and I wanted to make sure that, you know, it was going to survive and she was going to do good because we'd built a lot over those few years. And at the same time, I wanted uh, enough that I felt, okay, I got a good return off the time I'd invested and just kind of position it in a way that with, with the agreement that everyone was happy. Well, that's, that's intense. Uh, I think that'd be very difficult for a lot of people to see the writing on the wall and actually take action and say, okay, I, this is probably a good idea to, to leave while you can still get money out of it. It doesn't have to be based upon your company that was ba- in Beijing, but company valuation, I know you work with a lot of startups and maybe this is not your area, but you know, how does somebody value a company, especially early on or even in the middle? Like any, any ideas or tips or tricks? Because I've actually been asked that before, and I don't know if I ever have a great answer besides more of a retail type of business, but mm. uh, anything that you can speak to there? If for valuations, I'm, I mean, later on as the company grows, there's definitely different metrics you can use. You can use, you know, comparables, other transactions. You can use discounted cash flows. You can use different types of multiples. A lot of industries have certain standards, whether it's, you know, a smaller business where it might be, you know, one to two times sell discretionary earnings, or maybe it's a a kind of a bigger business and it's five times EBITDA. But just that startup itself, as bad as it sounds, a lot of these startups don't really have any value to them and they just get wound down. And I say that because, okay, you put in six months of your labor, they put in six months of their labor, each person put in 20,000. Does that mean the company's worth? 200,000 because that's what your time would have been if you were working at, say, Google or one of these companies that you gave up your employment to do this. Well, no one's going to pay for that because they're looking at it as going, I'm actually just stepping into your footsteps. This is a, a, a niche job that someone has to have these skills to grow it. You haven't found product market fit. You haven't found go to market fit. You haven't found any of this stuff. It's still just in the idea phase. It's really not worth anything except for that knowledge that you got building it out to that point that you can take away from. But yes, I mean, once you do get to certain certain milestones, there is kind of a standard value to it, whether it's, I mean, the sweetest spot is if you get 2 million in EBITDA, because right when you get there, so many doors open up, you know, private equity groups could look at you as a platform play and add others, you know, family offices, high net worth individuals could look at it. Everything's been established. You have the metrics where this dollar goes in, this much comes out. Other than that 2 million EBITDA, you know, one below that might be that 1 million ARR, uh, 1 million annual recurring revenue, because at that mark, that's a lot of VCs would come in and be kind of interested and start in, invest in because it matches up with their investment thesis. And and Darren, tell me if I'm just going off on way too much for you or your audience. But you know, this is these are the conversations I have all the time as an investment banker with with people. The the what one thing that puts value on a company is who is going to invest in it? Where's that exit? So if you have that thing that has value and there's investors, that pushes up the value. And what I mean by that is all these investors, all these people that have money, they have this thing called their investment thesis, and that's what they raised money against. So a VC, they're investing other people's money, private equity, other people's money, family office. It's, you know, there's that investor invest in this family's op- this money, but that family has what their criteria to put that money in. It has to be ESG friendly. It can't be this. It has to be local. It has to support this group or that. So if your company has something that has all these investment theses looking at it it has that value if it hits this sector this size this geographic location this area 
it has all these people competing against it. And so they'll make offers, they'll push that value up. And a lot of these people, their, their thesis, there has to be a minimum. If you're a VC and you have 10 million, 50 million or whatever, you can only write checks of this size. So say your minimum check size is 5 million. You know, you have to say this company's value has to be something that will make it so I'm okay with writing this check for this company. The people that I got money from are convinced that this number is okay to write a check to them. It's that whole down the line of who you talk to, who they talk to, because everyone's accountable to somebody. So when the company's bigger, like I said, 2 million EBITDA or smaller, 1 million ARR or below that, you'll, you'll get more of the high net worth individuals, the angels looking at it to write a check. And it needs to hit some of those numbers to have that one person interested enough to write a check, to step in, to take over. But when it's that very, very, very early stage where, hey, I got a website and we've had five visitors, it's great that you built that out. You can put that on your resume. But there's probably zero people in the world that will step in and actually give you something for that. Say somebody wants to do a startup. I'm in Austin, Texas. You're in California. There's so many people that want to do startups everywhere. But, you know, raising money seems like this kind of hole that they don't know anything about. You know, what advice would you give them to learn more, especially maybe at the you gave them the advice to get the, the real money after you got a million dollars or two million dollars of EBITDA. What about like when they just want to get started, that angel phase? Any advice there for them? Oh, man, I got, I got way too much advice for you there. So before, one of the first things I did when I came back to the U.S., I was the investment director for an angel group, the second oldest angel group in Silicon Valley. So when it comes to talking to angels and that, I got some good advice for you. First off, I love the phrase, you feed an army for a year to use them for a day. And that's exactly how you should think of angel investors that you have to build this long-term relationship with them over time where you're asking them questions what's your thoughts on this what's your thoughts on that not just go to them hey i need money also while you're meeting people build out a newsletter build out an update some of the most successful startups i've seen over the years and one of the companies like right now i've known them for five years they are consistently oversubscribed, consistently, you know, things come to them. What they have done is they do a quarterly newsletter to everyone they meet. Everyone that you go to an event, they make you, you're on their news, newsletter of just, hey, this is what we have accomplished this quarter. These are the milestones we hit. These are the milestones we plan on hitting in the next quarter. These would be great introductions for us, whether it's intros to strategic partners, whether it's intros to, um, a new employee, whether it's interest to an advisor, interest to someone, they ask that and they send it to everyone. And mm. you're looking at them going on this journey and you go, wait a second, I remember them last quarter, they hit these milestones and they did what they said they're going to do this quarter. And you see them over three quarters do that a year. Now you trust them. Now you're part of their journey. You see things go and you see, hey, they send you, you know, there's some pictures, uh, you know, attachments at the end of them giving speeches at conferences or something. You're, you're part of this journey. And there's several startups that I'm on their newsletter that I'm just watching them go through their seed, their A, their B round now, hoping that, you know, I'll get to help them later on. But to help them there, I'm helping them at the beginning, making intros going, oh, you need an intro to this person. I actually know someone at that angel group or that VC or, or that that fits what you're looking for. And I'm trying to help in hopes that I'm there for later on. And there's a lot of people that are in my same situation that want to help these startups. Maybe they can't write a check, but they know someone that can write a check or they know someone that's the perfect intro for them. So first off, tell everyone what you're doing. Social media, so many founders at the very early stage, they want to stay in stealth. They're scared. They're worried. They don't want everyone to know what they're doing. It should be the opposite. If you're in a pitch competition, you're telling everyone you're in the pitch competition. If you win, you tell everyone you won. You're taking pictures, you're putting on LinkedIn, you're putting on Twitter, Facebook. Everywhere. Your CEO should be the greatest salesperson alive. That should be his whole job is just selling the vision of what you're doing to everyone and getting that out there. And when that happens, it's kind of odd. People are going to start saying, hey, there's that person I know. This is what he's doing. I know someone that can help them. So you're building out that network. Also, a lot of people at the early stages, they they got they don't know 
how many angels they actually know. And what I mean by that is if you're a doctor, you're an angel. If you have that title VP of almost anything, technically you're an angel. If you know about the industry, so many laws have changed, you're an angel. I, this, this span of who's actually an angel nowadays, I, those general terms of you know, a million dollars in equity or 250000 for three years or 300000 if you're a VP at most tech companies or a doctor, that, you, you've hit that. If you own any property, it's appreciated. If you sold that, you hit. There's so many people that hit that, that you know those people that you're probably, you know, getting your teeth cleaned by someone right now that could write you a check. Or, I mean, the list goes on and on. So one, your network is, is bigger than you think for angels. Also, no, no one, I don't say no one. A lot of people don't know or tap into their alumni network. I sat down, mm -hmm. I kid you not, there was a startup one time masters at MIT. The other guy was getting a PhD at Stanford. And they said, Sean, we don't know any angels that will invest in us. I'm like, <laughs> right. I'm like, you're kidding. You get both of you guys have an uh, alumni angel network. Both of you guys, like it, the list goes on and on. And most universities now have an as a, have an angel alumni group. They have an alumni group that are in all these strategic companies that might invest. They have an alumni it's amazing this network no one taps into. So you have that. You have another one for you that most people don't leverage is the each city has an economic developer. That economic developer, his key metrics, KPIs each quarter are jobs retained, um, jobs increased, businesses retained, outside investment. They have you know three or four KPIs. If you go to them and say, listen, I have this product. And if one of these companies here comes, you know, signs on, I'll open up my office in your city. They're going to make that warm intro for you because they check off the, you know, new company, employment, outside capital. They check out all these boxes on their KPI. So they're happy. So there's this whole untapped network that people can use to get the intros to the angels, to the businesses and that at a very early stage of their company. And if you strategize it right, it, it's already there. Completely dropping some some knowledge of, of how to get funding and how to reach out. And I think it, just like, you know, you can take that same advice to a small company, small business, a personal brand. Got to get out there. Everybody you talk to, get, give them updates and maybe not just social media. I do love the uh, email update. I think that's going to steal that one for sure. And, and you know, what about like, when to get funding? When do you suggest somebody get funding? And when, when should they, right? So for your funding, key to map out your funding strategy. And what I mean by that is, if you take fun at the very beginning, you dilute yourself so much, later on, you're not going to have enough equity to really stay in the game, really be able to get those later rounds. What you want to do is you map it out. And just to throw a name down, there's a gentleman named Sam Wong, who's got, he's the CEO of Fundable Startups. He's had three successful exits. He's a great person to reach out to. In fact, Darren, if you're, if you're open, I'll make an intro to him after I'd, the show. I'd love it. Absolutely. His whole thing, and other people have said this too, is those key milestones, those inflections in, in when you hit that bump up valuations. And you should raise capital after you hit these key, these key valuation inflection points, not before, after. So maybe that's getting a patent issued. Maybe that's getting a new strategic account. Maybe that's, it could be a list of things, but it's after those moments you raise capital, not before. And you shouldn't raise capital based on a timeline. A lot of startups will say, I'm raising capital. This is, good. This is my runway for 12 months, 16 months. No, it should be, I'm raising capital to hit these milestones. And that's what's going to excite investors more when they hear, listen, these people, with this amount of money is doing twice what that company is doing with that money. Huh. I want to invest with these guys. Hey, they're doing in 12 months what's taking these other people's 24 months, at least for the funding wise. That's interesting. I'm, I'm interested in working with these guys. So map it out, not for time, but for the milestones you'll hit and make sure each of those milestones is a key milestone for increasing the valuation. I love it. So how does a mechanical engineer become an investment banker that's in M&A and, and stuff like that? How, how did that happen? 
Oh, well, when you, you go abroad for so long, your, your mechanical engineer skills become obsolete and you, <laughs> and you sit down and you're like, yeah, I could do this. And then you look at it and they're like, yeah, lab view 3.0. And you're like, lab view three. I was on lab view points. Wait, what? I, I, I can't use AutoCAD anymore. Okay. I'll yeah, just talk sure. to people. So <laughs> yeah, no. my, 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 my oldest brother's a, a mechanical engineer. So oh, cool I, guy. So this, 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 this question, and, and he's got his MBA too. And I think he's thinking about switching around a little bit. Definitely been doing the AutoCAD forever. So maybe this question is for him. Yeah, no, honestly, the, the whole thing for the mechanical engineer, it gives you the background to think critically, to analyze things, to put things in a systematic process. And a lot of people think you're smarter than you are by just saying you're an engineer. The investment banking, to be honest, almost all of it is, as, as truth be told, business development and talking to people and then seeing a story and then capture that story in a way that you can present it to fit what others are looking for and build that rapport, that dialogue. So if you take that processes of mechanical engineering and then some sales techniques and put together, that's actually a lot of things that are needed for an investment banker. That's so interesting. I would almost give that description of what we do. I own a marketing company and that's basically what we do for a for companies too. I mean, of course we also do a lot of graphics and all this stuff, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, how can we, you know, give them the best story? How can we story tell the best for them? And a lot of times we do it visually with photos, videos, website, whatever. But I think storytelling is something that's always been around and it's a skill that you have to have to be, you don't have to have, but it's going to make you much more successful if you do have it. Well, I honestly think you have to have it once you're at that C level of any company. Oh, and absolutely. that's even if you're the CTO or CFO, I think you have to be a storyteller once you reach that level. I, I yeah. I also kind of read with your background, you do a lot of speaking engagements. I think a lot of people are interested in, in that world. How, how do you, how did you start with that? And, and how do you actually get gigs doing that? Oh, so... I actually just, I started, I was actually really, really shy for the longest time. I, I kind of, when I was in China, heard about that whole, was it 840-80 principle? Have you heard of that principle before? Yeah, isn't that, isn't that the Alibaba principle? Or am I thinking the wrong thing? No, no. Like when you're eight years old, you care about what oh. everyone else thinks. When you're 40, you don't care anymore. When you're 80, you realize no one ever cared. <laughs> no, that's I love that though. And, and so I, I heard about that. I was like, oh, that's so cool because I was getting thrown as the Western person that could speak Chinese into, hey, we need someone that wants to speak at a coal mine uh, institute, you know, facility. Would you be interested in giving a presentation there? I'd go, okay. Hey, Sean, do you want to do this presentation or that or that, or that? And I got thrown into all these situations where I would, you know, give a small presentation in Chinese and they would clap and go, Oh, but so I had Lehi. I'd be like, all right, thank you. I got a nice trip here. You know, some nice money. Like, this is great. And I just took that. And when I was in the U S I just started getting opportunities because of the angel group of, Hey, you want to be a judge for this pitch event? Okay. I'll be a judge. Hey, Sean, do you want to give a presentation to this, you know, incubator on, you know, creating a pitch deck. Sure, I'll give a presentation. And it just kind of snowballed. And then with my background also with the Chinese, I got several opportunities to fly to China to give presentations for global pitch events there as a Silicon Valley representative. And it just kind of led, it just kind of grows. And a lot of it is just more someone sees you, someone knows you, sees that you've done some before, ask. And once you kind of get that reputation of, I'm open for it. You know, if it sounds fun, I'll do it. People, people offer, people present. And I, you know, I also make sure that I take everything seriously and provide good quality. I prepare, I prep really, I, I don't do anything half-ass. So yeah. At, at, at my last corporate job, they, they would always nick, 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 nickname me Mr. Prepared because I would over-prepare for these things. And I think there's a lot of slim similarities of people like us that are running these po podcasts and such. It's just like, you've looked at it and you're like, you know, I kind of want to do it, but that's not really my style. And then you just over prepare and you rock and roll and you do it. Do you think that helped, you know, you launch a, a podcast and all that and, and, and tell us about the podcast a little bit. 
Well, it's definitely helped with the podcast, and I've I've had several guests go, "Oh my gosh, you've really done your homework on me." I'm I'm, and it's funny too because everyone you talk to has just been on a podcast where the podcast host was the worst prepared and gave them the worst interview or something, and when they go to you and they're like, "Wow," and <laughs> that instantly builds that rapport, it builds that connection, and they see the value of you know, using their time in that. Whereas before it might've been a chore or some like a favor for you. Now it's the opposite. It's, well, I want to really impress this person who's the host who's put in all this time. So I think being prepared, I mean, that's, that's paid back tenfold for me on everything I've done. Going into the podcast, it, part of it was actually kind of being, I want to say lazy in the fact that, so before the investment bank and I was at an incubator, our headquarters in Beijing, I was on the Silicon Valley team and there's 15 incubators, 25 offices focused on artificial intelligence and blockchain. So we had startups from all over the world going back and forth, back and forth. And so when they would come to Silicon Valley, that would be my role, help them set up operations. Or if they're going from Silicon Valley to China, we would take them on road shows to these you know, industrial parks that the parent company built. One of the parent companies actually been in the news lately, so I'm not saying names, but you know, just throwing it out there. Hilarious. Um, <laughs> right. Y'all, you, you know, in advance when it's time to move on. So during this process, a lot of the companies that would come to me, they would ask the same questions. How do we localize our product? You know, can you introduce us to a lawyer to help us with our legal documents? How do you present to investors here? How do we, this or that? And I was getting the same questions and I thought, you know, I'd really like to interview these service providers, these people that work with these startups and create this reference library for them. So I did that. I did 46 episodes of it was called Silicon Valley Successes at the time where I interviewed some lead and service providers in the in Silicon Valley. I got noticed by a podcast platform. I had conversations with them. I did 32 episodes on, on their platform and then I rebranded to the Silicon Valley podcast. Now I'm on episode 115 are live. I've recorded 120. And in that process, I got to interview some huge names and it's been the greatest networking tool I could ever imagine. Yeah, and that's really one of the reasons why I started a podcast. One, I can, I, you know, and I've been in the photo video world for as long as I can remember just because I've loved it. So I have all these equipment. And I also saw myself as things were going well professionally, I kind of stopped networking as much. Mm. And I was like, you know what, I need to kind of do more of that. So that was one of the reasons. And one question I do have for your podcast, you know, getting those guests, how, and I have a lot of other people that have podcasts that are listeners and friends, you know, any tips or tricks to get those higher end guests, those better guests? Yeah. So first off, once you have momentum, momentum feeds momentum. So I know at the beginning it sucks and it hurts, but once you get to, I don't know why for me, it was once I hit episode 50, I started to get all the, and maybe you would know more about this. All these PR companies started sending me the people they're working with. Hey, this person would be a great guest for your show. And I think it had to do something with having that number 50, nothing else, just having that many shows. And then once I hit a hundred now, you know, the inbounds are pretty ridiculous on a daily basis. The first 30 were the hardest. For that, I was actually very fortunate. I have a friend, Alan Tien, who was on a panel with me in for the Guiyang Big Data Conference back in 2018. He's kind of a who's who. He, he brought PayPal to China when they tried to open up that, that region. He's very well connected, and, and I got to know him through that event, through that speaking opportunity. And I just said, hey, Alan, I'm starting a podcast. Is there anyone in your network, and I'd love to introduce you, that I could have as my guest? And he's like, hold on. And literally within 10 minutes, I had Patrick Lee, who's the founder of Ron Tomatoes. I had the CEO of Upwork. I had the CEO of Veeam. I had you know five CEOs of these big companies on my inbox, and, the whole, and their responses were, Sure, Alan, if he's your friend, I'll do it. And it was just off his his relations that he'd built up this whole time and him knowing me for a couple of years and trusting me that he'd open this up. And after that, once I had those in the can, once I had those first ones lined up, everyone else has been easy. Everyone mm -hmm. else was, 
hey, tell me about your podcast. Well, I've interviewed these people. And they go, oh, I'll be on your show. They never ask for numbers. They never ask for anything. It's always who else has been on your show. And as soon as you can point to a few people, they're, they're, it's all, I've gotten so many people going, oh, God, you, I, I'm not even sure if I should be on. I don't, I don't feel comfortable. I'm like, why? You're a cool guy. Like, you're my buddy. Like, come on this show. So yeah, I did four episodes I recorded with it before I had my name. I didn't even have Establishing Your Empire. I just wanted to move forward. And I was just using friends. And then it definitely gets to a part where either people come to you or somebody that you get have on the show brings you more people that are interesting. And if somebody refers, you, you already, I mean, I still look look them up, but I'm pretty much it's pretty much automatic yes because yep. if somebody's already interesting, they're gonna have they're gonna give you somebody who's interesting. There's not they're not gonna give you somebody that doesn't have a a great background and an interesting story. But I can't stress enough if you if you're ever thinking about opening and doing a podcast, just get started, get going. You don't you know get them recorded. You don't even have to release them if they're not gonna be good enough. But my guess is they will be. I, I got a hilarious story for Go you. Go ahead, it, please. The first podcast I ever and. Going back to what you just said right there, just start recording. The first 20 episodes of mine, if you go back to them, I am awful on them. You know, I'm stuttering. My questions aren't that good, like all this stuff. The first one I ever recorded, I got a warm intro to Melody Perkins, the co-founder of Canva. So my wow. first ever interview was with her. Okay, this, this, this tells you how amazing she is. About 18 minutes in, I was like, yeah, I don't have any more questions, but we need this to be at least 45 minutes. What do you want to talk about? And then her and her marketer were like, oh, we could talk. And then we're just like brainstorming. Then we record for five minutes. Hey, do you got anyone else have another question? We got, we went back and forth. You'll listen to the episode now and it sounds really good, but that's how bad my first episode was. So I don't think wow. any of your listeners could have it any worse than that. <laughs> but so yeah, just start and go. <laughs> Yeah. So my first, I had Christine Chen, who is my fourth episode, if you go back through, but she was my first one. We just didn't release that one. We re-recorded, but it just because, and then I edited my first, I still do a little tweaking, but now I have somebody else do it. But I edited all my first one because I wanted to hear myself, it, you know. It's, it's weird like, get to, hearing get yourself, to the point. isn't it? And you, you, well, and you're also like, get to the point, stop talking. You, it becomes this exercise and you're almost like a, a speech class, especially when COVID hit. It was great to have a platform to be able to speak to some people that are doing some cool stuff and that are trudging forward. And it, so it was a, a nice kind of anchor to have. So what's next for you? What, what's the what's five years? What, what's five years from now? What's it look like? It's five years from now. I mean, I've, I've brainstormed a couple of things. One thing I, I've been thinking of, I, I really wouldn't mind raising my own fund. But at the same time, I think the VC industry is ripe for disruption. With everything going out there, I personally, I don't see the value and, and hopefully no one quotes me on this later, but the value of the network is more valuable than the, the VC's check right now. In my mind, there's so many networks that are being built with, you know, NFTs, crowdsourcing, this and that, that I just see that whole industry being very disruptive or disrupted. But at the same time, I do kind of want to raise my own fund just because it's been on that, that goal. There's a lot of things I want to do with the investment banking, especially cross-border. I see Southeast Asia and Latin America. I see so much opportunity there in the years to come. It also would give me an amazing excuse to travel again. I, I've God, this last year, you go stir crazy. Yeah. And I just want to, you know, try to do bigger and bigger deals and keep pushing that comfort zone. I've noticed, and I was talking to my wife about this not too long ago, I, you know, when you're younger, you're okay with failing a lot more. I, I've, I've kind of, these last two years with the lockdown, been very conservative, very fearful and missed out on opportunities. I want to push my boundaries of that comfort zone and, you know, try to do more difficult deals, try to do more, more things. So that's kind of what I really want to, I mean, five-year goal, but definitely 2022 goal for sure. And if you raised your own fund, would you be something where you had kind of a specific kind of genre or narrow area or would it be, or what, what would it be? Off the top of my head, I would like it to either be a Southeast Asia fund or a Latin America fund. I like the ESG component. I see so much money in going in those directions. And I, I do see, I mean, they say half of all investment dollars are gonna go in, in that direction in the future. But that, I also, 
I just think so much change is going to happen in those areas and little wins makes it if if you get a unicorn company there and a unicorn company in the Silicon Valley is like, yeah, it's a unicorn company. Great. But if you get something there, it inspires everyone. I mean, look what Canva did to Australia. Right. I mean, really, I, I'll I'll talk to the companies there and Melody Perkins is seen as like a god almost. And it's like, yeah, we started our company because we saw what they did and it inspires a country, you know, it changes GDPs. And, and that would be cool to invest in a company in like Malaysia or or some country where next thing you know, it it, it sparks life into this ecosystem and know that, oh man, I kind of had a little thing to do with, or, you know, who knows, something like that would just be so much cooler than some tombstones on the wall of a couple companies you helped out that were like, yeah, we did paint buckets, you know? All right, man. Yeah. It's, it's one of your, your keys to be able to change the world. What about like, if we take it back to your high school, like 16 year old self, like, do you, it, you know, what, what advice would you give your young self? Definitely going back to well, one push the comfort zone. God, like I, I was, I, I, I see myself so many times as comfort zone. Okay. Push myself. And then that's when real things actually happen. And then I, go back to the comfort zone and then it's stagnant. And then I push myself and then changes. So I going, if I was back in high school, I would push myself comfort zone so much more, try to get out of there, try to start some businesses, then fail, try to travel back then travel. And you learn more overseas in a different country than you can in anything else. I think personally. So I, I would, I would, and, and also, you know, just ask people, have conversations with random strangers, sit there, try to get that one no a day for some idea you have. Or, you know, like I remember when I was in high school, I was like, it'd be cool to be a stockbroker, you know? And now I look back, I'm like, hey, wait, I actually could have done that. I could have taken a summer internship. I could have really done. I just thought, oh, you can't because you're that age. But nowadays there's age. That's kind of a cool thing about now that everyone's working from home. Age, geographic location, all these things have just been blown out the window. They, they don't matter. I've had conversations with people selling companies that are 14 in India now. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, we have a SaaS company with a million ARR. We're looking at like, how? How did you do any of that? You know, but it's Man, happening. The, the, the internet, it's a, it's a game changer. And now this blockchain is going to be just another level on top of that. A lot of people get fearful of it. But to me, I got excited. To me, mm. it was, you know, it's kind of the great equalizer that you and I can go toe to toe with anybody, no matter what your background is. What, what about like, what, what's one of your, you know, actually what, what's success look like for you? You've done a lot of cool things, but like a lot of people have some, some kind of measurement or some, something has to happen. What, what about for you? I don't know. Success for me changes every, every couple of years, to be honest. I mean, Right now, I think success for me is almost like being in okay shape. I'm starting to get like <laughs> that dad bod, even though I don't have kids yet. And it's, I don't know. But success for me is going back to not staying in my comfort zone for too long. If I stay in that comfort zone, I, I just don't grow. When I push myself, I see good things happen. Even though there are some setbacks, you know, company fails, this business partner takes off, this, you know, turns out to be a waste of three, six months or whatever on this project. or you know, and that's one thing I'm sure your listeners are familiar with it. When you try stuff, you know, you get screwed over here and there. You know, your business partner that you start that business with three months in, you want to kill each other. Or maybe they change all the passwords or, you know, who who knows wh what happens. But, you know, you, you took that risk and then you move on and good things come from that. Or, you know, life lessons. I don't know if you're in that stagnant gray zone. I, it's good for some people, I guess. But if you really want to have, you know, that that fulfilling life where you're traveling the world, you have these stories to tell people like my my family, they've never traveled. They've never lived abroad. I come home and I'm like, this is what I did in Europe. This is what I did in Thailand. This is what as to them. It's OK. We watch Netflix and it's it's so different. And I mean, Darren, I, you started a company. You've done so much. I'm sure looking back, you're like, you know, taking these risks. Even if they had all failed it, I would take them again. I'd, I'd like to take more. In fact, I, I think I relate to a lot of things you're saying. 
Definitely when I was young. I mean, I, I started my first company when I was 20, my second one at 21. That, that real ones. I had actually some stuff before that, but, you know, brick and mortar stores, real deal stuff. I mean, they're small companies, but like at that time they were massive, you know, to me. And I look at that and like, oh my God, I took some crazy risks, like <laughs> crazy risks. Like I literally could have been, you know, on the streets almost type of thing because I didn't have any fallback. And, you know, I, sometimes I... I have to remind myself to, to, to push that envelope like that and, and do it. And I, the traveling thing um, is huge for me too. And one of my least favorite questions, although I probably shouldn't be this way, is when people start bringing up, like, have you watched this show? Have you watched that show? And I'm like, no. Uh, and I've watched more now that I have a newborn because it just happens. <laughs> but, but I'm like, I, that's not what I want to talk about. <laughs> So I just discovered what emo was like a year ago, that whole like 2012, because wow. I was in China and we had no internet. Like I was blocked off of all social media. So wow. there's stuff going on that I'm introduced to now. And people are like, I, the whole financial crisis, 2008, I didn't experience any of that. Right. Like there's this whole gap here that, you know, 2008, 2013, I don't have any familiar what was happening in the u.s except for i'd come back find out who won you know the nba championship maybe a week or two and then i'd leave again and yeah. it's kind of crazy when you have those conversations with people where they're like yeah this is my favorite show i watch it every week they're like i don't have time for that because i'm doing all this other cool stuff on the side investment banking is really neat the venture capitalists angel investors any advice for somebody who wants to get into that world you know yeah how, yeah go ahead oh well, i mean so many ways to get into it it, it okay and it's either, you know, you network your way into it, you go to this like line of school and you get into it, or you're successful and then you just start making your own investments and you kind of go. So let's let's start with the angel investing. Angel investing is super easy. I'd recommend you join an angel group. You just shadow everyone for six months, not make any investments because some people they go into that, they're like, oh, these are so cool, these startups. And the next thing you know, they've made four investments. They've all just self-employed it you know it's just been a mess and they're like yeah, i'm not I'm, I'm done no no just sit back watch have your questions set know what sector you want to invest in based on your background like hey listen this is going to be my investment thesis as an angel i'm going to write this size check because say i have a hundred thousand to invest i'm going to write ten thousand dollar checks into 10 companies over a two-year span i'm going to look at at least 50 companies before i make any you know write any check I'm going to know the founder for at least three months in advance, have this many meetings. I'm going to be on their newsletter. Like, have your investment thesis all lined up before you make any investments as an angel. So that, that'd be my, my information to so join the angel group and get to know the angel groups first before you join. They're all different. They have their own cultures, all of them. You know, this one, you might really get along with these others. You'd be like, these guys are terrible. I don't like any of them. They're just, you know, blah, blah. Get to know the culture of the group first. See how they support their investments. And the angel group is a great segment into the VC. Because in that angel group, you know, you you could start leading angel syndicates where you're bringing a bunch of angels in to invest in like an SPV, special purpose vehicle or something like that. You get a track record of doing a couple of these. Next thing you know, you pitch that to investors and go, hey, I want to raise my own VC fund. I've done all these SPVs on the side. Here's four of them. They've been successful. Look at the track record. Hey, I'm going to take my investment in these and put it in the fund so you're already getting a return on something. So you have that track record of bringing capital together and deploying it. And you know you have your, your screening process that you could show. So that's a good way to get into raising your own VC fund. If you want to work at a VC, well, from that angel group, guess what? The way that investment works, it, it, it's very systematic. This group knows this group that knows this group that knows this group. So this group introduces their deals to these people. These people introduce their deals to these people. So what you want to do, and that's why a lot of you know, these name brand VCs are so successful, they have their deal pipeline from beginning to the end. They know these angels invest and they make introductions to them. These micro VCs will introduce to these VCs. These VCs will introduce to these private equity groups. You know, or they'll sell it off or they'll take it public or whatever the chain is. But, you know, it's all lined up. So when you're working with these angels and maybe you're there just as a volunteer or you're a member or you're writing checks or, or you're finding deals for them, somehow you have involvement, you're building this network, you're going to meet VCs in that process. And then, hey, I want to come on board and do an internship. Hey, I want to be an analyst. Hey, I want to look at your deals. Hey, tell me what your investment thesis is. And then I will start bringing you deals that 
the angel group sees to you in advance for your deal flow. Great. You build relationships with a couple of them. Next thing you know, it's, hey, every time that Sean brings me a deal, you know, 50% of the time we really like that deal. You know, we're going to have a, a position opening up for our next fund. Hey, Sean, are you interested in doing it part time, full time? What's kind of, you know, you've built this relationship over a year or two. Now you're at the VC stage. Great. You're building that relationship there. You got that deal flow coming in. Well, your investments, your portfolios, you're making introductions from them to these later stage VCs. Or, hey, our portfolio company wants to exit. Can this investment bank help with the exit? Let me make an intro. You're building your network there. And then, hey, I'm done with VC. I want to be an investment banker. I've known you guys for like the investment bank I'm at. I got to know them from five years ago when I used one of their portfolio companies or a company, not portfolio. They raised capital for this one company and they're looking for a new manufacturer in China. I have some connections in China. I made the intro. They were happy. I stayed connected with them. And, and you know, that's how I got to this one. It, it's that's just a, that slow play, line. you know, yeah. that slow play and just being involved. There's so, so, and then that advice can transition to so many different areas of life for just being involved, being around. Cause a lot of times what happens is, is if you're around that they get to know you and they'll start asking you questions or you'll start feeding them um, some information and you, you never know what will happen. Yeah. I mean, uh, half of life is showing up what, you know, that's saying <laughs> it's true yeah. though. If you're it's in that, true. if you're in that field, if you're playing that game, if you're around, eventually stuff happens either or either one they push you out or two they take you in <laughs> i guess that is that's great either way and this is my last question i always end the podcast this way is how would you like to be remembered oh gosh <laughs> i wish you had prepped me on this one i don't know I, I i guess i'd like to be remembered as that guy that always brought that that any situation he was in it left better than when he entered like that, that's, I think I'd be happy with that. If everyone's like, oh, anytime, like he entered a relationship, the relationship ended better than when he wasn't there. Friendship, family, work, business, projects, anything. It was just, he always added something to it. And I think I'd be happy with that. Well, Sean, thank you so much for being on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. It was a real pleasure. Darren, thank you for inviting me. We got to do this again. All right, man. Cheers. Cheers. 